We had six people at a dinner table that were all vibrating at a, at a different frequency. So the conversation had no choice but to yeah. go to that level. And I and sometimes I think the reverse happens when people are in a lower frequency. They attract the people of that frequency. And then those thoughts keep perpetuating. Dr. Mindy here. Your body is in a, in a war zone. This is different parts yes. of the brain get activated depending upon how stressed you are. When you look at it from that inflammatory. That's interesting. I mean, I that has some merit to it for sure. And you can't control everything. Yeah, say. And what about the uh, a woman who is not pregnant, but she's aiming? Here's where I want to start this conversation. One of the things that um, I probably didn't say the first time we met is that uh, one of my pet peeves in life is going to dinner with people and having these really superficial conversations. I yeah. hate it. And I will leave a dinner party very quickly because of it. And man, yeah. that when we sat down to dinner, what I love about you is you just dove, like you went right in and we yeah. went deep so fast. Is, is that, is that because of the group we were with, or do you walk around with the depth of, of, uh, stimulating conversations like this everywhere you go? That's a great question, and I appreciate the compliment. Uh, I would say it's kind of a little bit of both. I think, you know, my read of you, similar to myself, is that we're very perceptive. And so I'm able to, not necessarily even consciously, but sort of subliminally understand my audience and mm. choose my conversations appropriately. So mm. I think it's really the former, which is because of the audience that, we were for each other, you know, all mm -hmm. discerning, intelligent, curious, and obviously inspired by these kind of conversations that that sort of lent itself for me to perhaps discuss things that I wouldn't in another circumstance. So uh, I think it's predominantly courtesy of who we all were for each other and, and your mm -hmm. listening that was there between you and Danica and stuff. But um yeah, I, I, I typically don't share to those depths if it's an mm. audience that I feel is either not so interested and not necessarily because they're not interested, but they don't know to be interested, right? Like that yeah. sort of form of not knowing what you don't know, uh, but also perhaps the bandwidth or the capacity isn't there. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Do you think that we are in a certain frequency with our thoughts, with our health, and when we get around people that are in that same frequency, these conversations become so easy to have. And that's, that was sort of my sense was like you were, we had six people at a dinner table that were all vibrating at a, at a different frequency. So the conversation had no choice, but to yeah. go to that level. And I, and sometimes I think the reverse happens when people are in a lower frequency, they attract the people of that frequency and then those thoughts keep perpetuating do you do yeah. you feel like we're frequency beings like that a hundred percent you know like you look at harmonics and resonance and dissonance right like even a lay person might say something as trivial as like oh they've got a good vibe or i don't like their vibe you know mm -hmm. um sort of colloquialisms that are pointing to this vibratory state that they're picking up on so for sure when there's you know, and this is romantically too, right? Like, why is it you're mm -hmm. drawn to certain people? There's a particular resonance. Your soul signature is not necessarily consciously, but at a deeper level, recognizing something. And that doesn't mean, by the way, that in that impulse to be drawn to somebody, that it's nirvana and it's rainbows and unicorns. You might be drawn to somebody because there's something that you're in this soul journey to reconcile. And that being is the catalyst for that to happen. Right. Yeah. So, but to me, yes, it is all about frequency. I mean, quote Tesla, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, if you understand the universe, uh, look at it in terms of vibration, frequency, and energy. So yeah. that's, that's what I traffic in. <laughs> so then where my brain goes with that, and this is how I've lived my life, is that if you want a different experience in your life, it starts by working on your own frequency first. And to sure. me, frequency comes from ju not just your thoughts, but it comes from your health, it comes from your body, it comes from your soul. So everything yeah. you do on a day-to-day -day basis to, to elevate your frequency is going to allow you to attract a higher frequency tribe, if for lack of a better word, to you. Do you feel yeah. like that it's an inner journey like that if you want to have a different experience in life? A hundred percent. One of my, I write in quotes, which you may recall, I, I'm sure I shared a lot at dinner, but 
uh, one that comes to mind is frequency precedes form, right? Mm. So for sure, the resonance of frequency at which we like oscillate and we occupy is the predetermining signature that will attract people and circumstances. Now, mm -hmm. in your speaking, there's a few semantics that I'd point out just because it's you, but it's like when you say that we try to raise our frequency or you said I, the, the person we believe ourselves to be is the obstacle to the frequency that we wish to attain. I don't know. Ooh, say that. Say that again. See, this is what I love about you. You're like, it, you like, mind <laughs> that was good. Go for that. Yeah. So it was something like, maybe I can do it verbatim, but the person that we think we are is the obstacle to the frequency that we wish to attain. Right. So mm. meaning our current idea of ourselves is fundamentally old, right? No, meaning like you look at something like physiologically, our skin, right? Our hair, our nails. So everything is in perpetual motion. Right. Yeah. Like we have never been the same physiological person for more than a second, which for most people, if that's all they got from this podcast would take them hours to like unpack. Right. It's yeah. like, what? Like, I thought I'm this. Yeah. But even in the 20 seconds that I shared that there's so many moving parts in your physiology that you're never the same you. So yeah. where this gets really sticky is with our psychological view of ourselves, our identity, our persona. Um, because people think they are like their name, their religion, their nationality, all of these things are, you know, just understood by common knowledge of, well, yeah, of course I'm English and I'm American. I mean, I, I get it, but they're not truths, right? So the body, you have no choice, but for the body to move. Hmm. It's, you know, heartbeat, nails are growing, hair's growing, la la la. But psychologically, people become very stagnant very easily because they become attached to their identity as, as though that's who they are. But it's such a disservice to their capacity to evolve. And then that's what I feel is the precursor to the cascade of sickness that shows up in the physiology. Yeah. Not because the body is sick, but because you stagnated in the view of yourself and with all of these subconscious constraints, limitations, inadequacies, insecurities, which carry to go back to our previous point, a darker resonance, a heavier frequency, like then that will manifest over time. It's just physics in the physiology, right? Ooh, so, yeah. so to go full circle to your question about raising frequency, yes, you can consciously do it with real discernment, but invariably it requires inspiration, something that you see, you witness, you hear, hopefully conversations like this. Mm -hmm. Or there can be, that's an external form of stimulus, or there can be an internal form of stimulus, which is more an intuitive, in, like a sense of awakening that like, oh my gosh, I've done X behaviors for 5, 10, 15 years, only to my own detriment. And so I've realized now that that correlates to the way that my mom spoke to me, my dad said this, and that's an old pattern that I'm now willing to relinquish, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, so there has to be some form of stimulus where we do it, quote unquote, by ourselves is, I think, a little bit of a misnomer. Like this paradigm that we're in is for reflection, right? We can have mm -hmm. internal insight. I've done a lot of my work just through downloading higher levels of consciousness. But also there's been external stimulus that has been the inspiration for me to go, oh, hang on a minute. What they just said just helped me see something about myself mm -hmm. that I was previously oblivious to. And in that transition, frequency rises. It's not that mm -hmm. I'm going oh, you know what? It's Friday. I'm going to go out and raise my frequency today. Right, right, <laughs> right. right. So, but it is a necessary part of the evolution of ourselves to you know, fundamentally realize our true nature, which is my assertion as to why we're here. So... <laughs> Oh, that was, there's so many, this is why we, I loved our conversation. I'm like, oh my God, which path do I go down? But here's where I want to go that I think will be really helpful to my audience is yeah. when the body is in a state of dis-ease, uh, yeah. you know, we can call it disease, but to me it's dis-ease. Right. Is it, does it mean that we are not congruent with our true nature and, and the frequency that our soul wants to emerge and come out of and this person we want to become, but we're, something's holding us back. So it creates dis-ease and disharmony in the body. And now we feel ill. Ill Is there a, is that a great way to look at chronic uh, conditions in the human body? A hundred percent. I'd say they're completely commensurate, right? Like they're inextricably connected. Like when people talk about mind body connection, and I'm sure you know this just because of your awareness, but it's not a connection. It's a continuum, 
right? Mm -hmm. Like they're, they're one and the same thing, just functioning at different densities. Like you look at water and then you look at steam and you look at ice, like they're, they're all the same, but just in different states, right? Yeah. So likewise, we have different levels, different hierarchies in the way that we express ourselves and how we identify. So for me, I mean, I literally had such a beautiful conversation yesterday with someone I'd never met before, 62, mm -hmm. been through three years of cancer treatment with radio, um, radiation chemotherapy, you know, with all mm -hmm. the deleterious effects of that, which is just horrific. And in 45 minutes, I helped her understand one of, I'm not saying that it's completely the cause, but one of the, the predominant reasons as to why cancer arose, right? Mm -hmm. And it was because from a very young age, and nobody knows who she is, so I can share, but from a very young age, that she had had an experience. It wasn't even that traumatic, but she was playing around with her brother and just having fun and da da da. And the parents, it was late, and so they screamed like, "Be quiet, go to your room, da da da." And as a sensitive girl at that age, she, unbeknownst to herself, took on the constraint of like, "I just did something bad. Don't do anything wrong again to upset anyone." Mm. Cut to 49 years later of living in this prison of don't do anything wrong ever. You can, you know, even as I say those words, everybody listening can feel the tension yep. that that stimulates, right? Yep. Like you're on eggshells, the vigilance, mm. especially for women, which I think is more so the case than men with regards to this particular constraint. Men have their own constraints. But, you know, for, for her to live in this world of vigilance and uh, not wanting to do anything to ruffle feathers was such a state of dis-ease. And again, I can't categorically say that is why. There are so many right. contributing, contributing factors. But I was explaining to her what is the physiological etymology of cancer, right? Like when a cell fundamentally loses touch with the intelligence of the body, like every mm. being has a primordial imperative to survive. Right, you try mm. and chase a fly or a mosquito around your room, they're going to run away. Right, like they, they are. Yeah. We're all built to survive. So when a cell, to me, in the way I explain this, is in a hostile environment, it will find a way to survive in the absence of the nucleus of that organism. Right, like like I'm no longer part of it. Like she left the family because of the hostile environment that she was in at a very young age. And this is what happens when teens, quote, unquote, run away. To me, mm. that's sort of an analogous to what's happening on a cellular level when someone gets sick. You're no yep. longer in, in a, a nourishing, nurturing, loving, kind environment. So you have to, quote, unquote, figure it out by yourself. Yeah. And so when she saw this, like, I mean, it was so moving. She's like, I mean, first of all, there's so much sadness because she's like, I've wasted 45, 50 years of my life being somebody who isn't who I truly am, right? Wow. And so, but I said, yes, but most people get to the end of their life and they never realize that. So at least yeah. be grateful that you're seeing this hideous pattern that is not your fault. There's no shame or guilt because it's unconscious. Anyway, a long-winded way of saying that, yes, with regards to dis-ease, the energetic feelings, emotional and the psychological constructs that we've created unbeknownst to ourselves, and I would assert we're actually here to reconcile, that's our karmic journey as a human being, they are the precursor mm. to it manifesting in the body, which is in fact sort of the gift, because if you don't have it actually represented in a physical form, you don't see it, or it's, it's less obvious, right? Yeah. So it's almost like the, the movie metaphor, like you're in a theater and the movie is at the back being projected through because of the light onto a screen. And if, if there was no screen, it would sort of, the, the light would dissipate across infinity and you wouldn't get to experience what is at the back. Does that make sense? Yep. Like, yep. Likewise, our body is almost like the screen upon which the, um, it, the inadequacies, insecurities and scarcities of our own subconscious get to reflect so that we can be responsible for transcending them. That to me is um, the human journey. Oh my God. I, ha I have so many thoughts on this. So the first thing I want to say is that what I heard you say is that we are here to rectify what our soul's purpose is. Is that the way I just heard that? That yes, we that, come into human form in order to play yeah. something out that the soul wants to 
unwind. Correct. In this particular dimension of planet Earth, you know, like everyone's like, oh, we want, you know, world peace. I'm like, that's not going to happen. That's not what this dimension's about, right? So for whoever we are, you, me, and Joe Blow, who's listening, your soul was encapsulated in certain forms of constraints and limitations, what I call inadequacies, insecurities, and scarcities, right? The I'm a not, not enough, I'm mm-hmm. a failure, I'm da da da. And so this particular dimension is the container within which each of those constraints gets stimulated, which mm-hmm. is the gift. Now, a lot of people don't see it that way. They actually will placate, they'll numb, they'll escape the pain, like right. through any means of like self-medication, right? Like the weeds and the smoking and the whatever. But in fact, if you understand, no, I arrive with my bucket of fears and constraints and this particular construct is designed so they they get stimulated or what we might say get triggered. Your mother-in-law says this, your husband does that, your boss da da, and you get pissed. So wherever, again, this is one of my more popular quotes, they say life will present you with people and circumstance to reveal where you're not free. That's the opportunity. Mm. You're being shown where you're not free. Now, if you play the game that way, it becomes an exciting proposition to discover more freedom by transcending where I'm not free. But most people don't look at it that way. They try to escape the discomfort of not feeling free, which we could equate to suffering. And then they use whatever means they have to, which is fine. That's just where they're at. But yes, so that is my my assertion. I can't categorically say it's true. But as a soul, which is boundless, limitless, pure love, pure freedom, that's our nature. But for whatever reasons in the cosmos, we got bound with these constraints of inadequacy. And so it's like, okay, let's go over here because that's where you can unravel, mitigate and transcend these to come back to your true nature, which is pure love, pure boundlessness and freedom. Oh my gosh. So, so two things I have to say on this. First, what I just heard in that, and I want, I don't want anybody listening to this to miss this, is that when trials and tribulations show up, it's an opportunity. If we approach it as an opportunity to, to work out some energetic reason that our soul is here to work out the healing of, of, um, our, our true nature. And we can look at it as an opportunity now we don't run from obstacles. We see them as the possibility of expansion for what the soul is here to do. So there actually were obstacles put in our in place for our best interest, for our soul's best interest. Uh, is that what I just heard? Yeah, and it gets even more subtle because it's not even that obstacles are presented for our best interest. We currently are the obstacle. Oh, it's, yeah. our, and it's we we and that's coming from our ego or is that coming from the traumas like it's yeah, our it's interpretation of trauma, ego and trauma so like trauma is just a life experience that is revealing something that we arrive with as a form of constraint that we're here to reconcile and again i can't repeat that but it would be worth rewinding yeah, <laughs> so, yes. so, so basically yes the trauma is something that happened to us right it's an event But my assertion is that the trauma was uh, synonymous. It was the resonance with which we arrived to curate the events that were appropriate for us to experience the current constraint that we're in. Now, for some people, it's instantaneous, instantaneous that they're like, oh, my gosh, like I transcend that. But it's usually in your 30s, 40s and 50s. When you're a kid, you don't have the discernment. So it really is horrific that. Your mother said, you're a mistake. We never wanted you. Or that your father said, well, how come you struck out? You should have hit that. You know, and for that little boy, it's like, I'm a failure now. And he may not get to revisit that constraint of I'm a failure for 30 years. You know, when he's presenting in a a huge auditorium and a company that he gets paid, you know, $200,000 and he's an expert, but he's got sweats and hypertension and and he doesn't understand why. Well, his fear, fear of failure has never been reconciled. Now, many people might say, well, it's the chicken and the egg. Did he have the fear of failure prior to his father reprimanding him or belittling him? Or was that event the catalyst for it to be created? My assertion is it's the former, right? Mm-hmm. Because you arrive with this. That's the opportunity. And so, yes, you attract the quote unquote obstacles of trials and tribulations, mm. but but they're really just an extension of you because there is no separation. So that wow. comes back to the circle to resonance. Like you, you change your frequency on a radio. It's like, oh, you didn't suddenly see this song whisk 
into the room and find the radio, right? It's everywhere, mm. right? So you go from rock, hard rock to R&B. It's not like, oh, hey, everyone, get like boys to men over here now. We're done listening to ACDC. Like, no, it's <laughs> everywhere. Like, so yeah. the shift in frequency, the events arise simultaneously. So what I love about the simplicity of your message is that I think, and I'll just speak for myself, I grew up in a really happy uh, environment, um, but there was a lot of chaos within that happy environment. Very loving family, but my sister was quite the rebel and she just created a lot of disharmony and uh, there was a lot of yelling. And so I became the peacemaker and I was the one that walked around the family and made sure everybody was happy. And I, over the years have been realizing that that I, I, I play that pattern out over and over and over again. And here I am at 53, I'm starting to go into some EMDR therapy and I realize. I don't want to be the peacemaker anymore. I don't want to do that anymore. But confronting that is really hard. And then the second thing is I've recently been acknowledging that that be that environment was traumatic, even though it was loving. And I think we yeah. tend to think of traumas as like child abuse or, you yeah. know, abandonment. But here I was in a loving, chaotic family, and yeah. I have a trauma that's continuing to play out. How, yeah. When you have that realization of something that may be holding you back, how do you go after it? How do you unwind it? It's a great question and uh, sort of a multitude of avenues, you know, like it could be through something like this, like just bringing it up in a safe space where somebody might be able to reflect something, which I'm, I'm happy to do. So, you know, you're obviously super smart and discerning. So you have the capacity for self-reflection. Somebody else might need literally to sit down with a therapist or a coach, mm-hmm. you know, to speak things through. Some people don't even know what they want to say because their environment was not conducive to self-expression, right? Kids that were seen but never heard because mm-hmm. go to your room, be quiet, shut up. And so they developed the conditioning of like my feelings, my expressions, my opinions don't matter. So that becomes sort of really slippery and insidious because they don't even know how to talk about what they want to talk about because they've never learned to talk about it. Right, right. right. So even the woman I helped yesterday, she was sort of fell in that bucket a little bit. And for her to just start to express herself and even get emotional, for her to just say, wow, I'm feeling so sad. Like that was sort of a massive breakthrough in and of itself, let alone then having the feeling of sadness. Because if you go back to what I shared, she was in the prison, self-created, not through her fault, but just uh, an, ad- an ad- adaptation to survival to basically function like a, mire, a mouse, like don't do anything to upset anyone. So you could suddenly see that the form of self-expression became completely inhibited, right? Yeah. So for you, your soul's journey, clearly with a sister who was more rebellious, even though the environment seemingly was loving, and that's just going to be your interpretation that's not categoric right it's not objective but what we can hear from mindy is that clearly you saw chaos and took it upon yourself to try and rectify that now that's just a broad stroke right but if you really feel into it that is an exhausting proposition it was yeah (laughs) it is that's why i'm trying to unwind it it's it is exhausting yeah So if we were to break that down and really look at the underlying intention, it seems sort of almost philanthropic, like you're the peace, you know, you're the peace provider and the peace bringer and you want everyone to be happy. And there's no quote unquote surprise that you became a doctor. And certainly at the level that you're at, like with the sensitivity, you know, you're this caregiver. But at what expense would be my question, right? And we don't have to go through your whole history of what you've been through in relationships and psychological issues or physiological ramifications, the disease that you had to go through, right? The, 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 what is it called? The, uh, the wounded healer, right? Like, so you've, you've used to other people's benefit your own suffering as a means of helping, which is great. But my invitation for you, and thank you for sharing yourself, would be looking at, okay, what is the underlying subtext of the need for a child, because that's where it started, to try to find, you know, harmony and bring the status quo to the household? Like, what, what was that like for you? 
Oh, it, it it brought me love. It gave me love. If I if I became the good one, the peacemaker, I got my mom was an incredible loving mother. I got I got a lot of mother's love for sure. Yeah. Amazing. Right. So now you start to see that this falls into a value proposition for you, right? Like there's various buckets that we relate to as humans. So what that little girl learned, and I'll use someone else, you can maybe through correlation see the similarity, a different pattern, but look at a Jim Carrey or a Robin Williams, right? Mm -hmm. So we all know how did they discover love and attention through comedy, being the clown. Yep. So you can see, but then Jim's done a lot of work and he subsequently transcended all of his identity or m much of it. But with someone like Robin, who obviously sadly left us, you know, he, it became his demise because he never got out of the prison, even though he got all the accolades and the attention and the millions of fans and dollars and da, da, da. It was all being, it was a maladaptive response to his mm. deeper feeling of fundamental inadequacy or no value, right? Yep. We have these adaptive processes and most of them are maladaptive. They're coping mechanisms. So Mindy learned this coping mechanism called, okay, I'll keep the peace whilst everybody else is losing their head. Now, we yeah. could look at it as a beautiful attribute. Look at who you are for so many people in your practice. It's beautiful. But again, I will keep coming back to oh, what expense and how genuine is it? Now, you're a genuine human, but energetically, to what degree is there a level of inauthenticity about the way you're doing it? Because it's still that little girl trying to find this, this homeostasis around her when, in fact, that's not what this world's about. Right. And that's why it's exhausting. Yeah. So if she felt, and I say she kind of almost to identify as a separate entity to you, the need to try to placate circumstance and keep everyone happy in order of a way of garnering love, what does that say about her fundamentally? If she needed right. to do that, what was that little girl's perception of herself without doing anything to keep everyone happy or healthy? Well, that's what I've been, I've been uh, working on is that there's, there's a worthiness yes. that comes from, I mean, you're right. This might be why I do what I do. There is a worthiness that comes from helping, from fixing. It, it takes me right back into that place yeah. of this is who I am. This is my position in this family. This is my position in this life. It, yeah. And what I'm trying to, I'm, I'm actually literally like a month in to really working on unwinding this. But what I'm seeing is I've put myself in that position in my marriage. I've put it in my business. I've put it in yeah. my friendships. Everywhere I go, I keep putting myself in that place of peacemaker and harmony um, because yeah. it's what gives me love and worthiness. And I'm, and it is exhausting and I am trying to unwind it. And it's, and yeah. it's, the so awareness is first, right? Interrupt. So it gives me love and yeah. worthiness, right? So I'm going to call BS on that, not because you said it oh, wrong, but because it's beautiful. not categorically true. So it occurs. It occurs as though it gives you love and worthiness. But this mm. is like your addiction, right? Whenever yeah. we think that what we're looking for is garnered externally to us, it's an addiction. Mm. Now, you could say that yours is a healthy addiction because you're helping people. But what your body and your energy is saying is that I am dependent, Mindy is dependent on garnering, receiving attention, accolades, acknowledgements, thanks, gratitude, and beyond that, just the results of my care and providing insight in order to feel love and worthiness. Yeah. So now can you yeah. see how dangerous of a slippery slope that is? Because what's the fundamental lie about that particular pattern that you have in place? Oh, well, I, I think I would say the fundamental lie is that I have to do anything to be loved. Can I just be love? Yes. Well, that's a good question to start. I can, I mean, I can categorically give you the answer. But <laughs> yeah. So the like without any, that I want you to go, Yeah. Like yeah. without any expectation from other people, you know, it also has created this me always thinking about the people around me and putting them first and me second. And that is yeah. not serving me anymore. Great. Awesome. And I love that we're having this conversation. So I want you to recognize that's not something you're doing. That's a pattern. That's the addiction. It's automatic. Yeah. You don't get right. up in the morning and make a conscious choice, a creative conscious choice that would be out of nowhere to say, you know what? I'm going to go above and beyond to help X, Y, and Z today. 
it's already there, right? The pattern of you doing what you do is so ingrained, you're, you're loosening it, which is great. And my, my intention is during this conversation that you're going to see something you've never seen before, but we'll get to that in a minute. So, but you're, it's so automated that you think that's who you are, which goes back to what I said when I, I said, I wish I could repeat that. And I tried to repeat it about raising your frequency. The person who wants to raise their frequency is the obstacle to the frequency that we're trying to attain. So the yeah. person you think you are is the quote unquote current obstacle to the essence of the higher version of yourself that is waiting to be born, which is great. You're, you're, you're in yeah. the, you're in the delivery canal right now. <laughs> I right? love it. Let's birth me, birth me, Peter. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so let's look at the love and worthiness that you think you get. That was an adaptation, albeit maladaptive to the idea that you weren't getting that automatically, which you, you were to some degree, you said it's a loving environment, but you found your role. You found the means mm -hmm. to which you could feel better about yourself to find a sense of contribution and work. Right. And again, yeah. I'm not poo-pooing any of this. This is wonderful. You've, 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 that changed thousands of lives, I'm sure. But if we look at what you accurately said, or the question you asked, well, can't I just be loved or worthy without that? That's a powerful question, right? Because now you start to actually reconcile and mitigate the need to do something and maybe just rest in the beingness of who you are and realize that the love and worthiness that you've been craving externally is inherent. It's not something it's already there. Get. <laughs> ah, okay. So, so I'm not, I'm not accessing it. I'm not bringing it into, from the subconscious to the conscious is what I hear. You, well, beyond that, even it's your nature. I would assert love and worthiness are your nature. This is so powerful when people hear this and they don't know it, that self-worth never changes. Now, okay. that's not the world people live in. You know, they had no. a job in a corner office and they're making six figures and they felt their worth was good at that point. But prior to that, they came out of college and they were working in a bar and, you know, they felt kind of cheap and they were abused by guys and their worth didn't feel so good. And then they dated a guy who had just adored them and they felt really good about themselves. And then they dated a guy who kind of was emotionally abusive and they didn't feel, right? There's this oscillation, this constant yeah. roller coaster of how somebody feels about themselves. But that's illusory. Your worth is intact, always has been, always will be. The only version of worth that changes is your self-perception. Now, what's happening with Mindy is that your worth is so correlated to your idea of the role that you play that in order to sustain your perception of worth, you have to keep the role intact. <laughs> yes, yes, that's, that's what exhausting. I just discovered. <laughs> but that's <laughs> Help me undo that. Right. Well, we are baby steps, right? So don't worry. So the first thing to recognize is the worth and the love that you crave, like anybody else out there. So you're a beautiful role model and poster child for this conversation, especially for women, because women tend to fall into that role of care provider and people pleaser. So your perception that your worth is out there based on the impact you make or the people that you help or the peace that you create is both illusory and futile as an endeavor. Because it's, this is the metaphor I'll give you. And I gave this woman I spoke to yesterday. If you know Arizona, obviously, if in the middle of the summer, it's 110, 120 degrees, and you're driving in your car, this is how Mindy drives. She has the air conditioning cranked. She is so well aware of her environment being like scorching hot. And so she rolls down all of the windows of her car, cranking the air conditioning, the intention, the aspiration, the hope being that I can cool down Arizona and then I will be okay too. <laughs> yes. Yes. I actually had a, a coach one time tell me, he he said, this is the way I vision, envision you, Mindy, as you're standing on out on a mountain type top with your arms stretched out and everybody in your life is holding on to the arms and you're trying yeah. to keep your arms out holding these people up. Yeah. And yeah. It, like when he said that, I was like, yeah. And that was 20 years ago, Peter, when I had somebody say that to me, I was like, yeah. you are a thousand percent right. Yeah. So amazing. And so the arm metaphor, the image I love because women particularly and care providers like you envisage love, the way that we have understood love is that it's, it's a verb. It's something that we do for others. 
I'm loving. And especially as a doctor, I care for other people. So your arms become a container. Yes. Right? Does that make sense? So you're uh, from your, husband, your friends, to your family, to your sister, your parents, to now your patients and clients, you know, your arms around them. Oh my God, Wendy's, whoever I spoke to, like even Danica this morning, like, oh my God, Wendy's amazing. People love you, right? Like it's, yes, it's so. categorical, no doubt. But what I want you to understand is you're missing the point of love. Love, yes, it's something that you have the capacity to do and to share, but love is an essence that includes you. So when you visit, mm. visit the arms, and the screen's not quite wide enough, but the arms that you have around people, I want you to take a set of arms that now also go by, behind you. Oh, that's good. That's a good metaphor. And, and is it just an energetic sense? Like, well, it's like, both energetic, but now for you, particularly because much of your strength is through awareness and intellect, now you can understand and go, oh my gosh, yeah, love includes me. And then you have a visual, you're more of a fire type, so you're a visual person. So I gave you something to look at. So it's like, oh, wow, what would it feel like for me to have arms around me too? Because that little girl whose sister was rebellious and recalcitrant and all over the place, like she didn't have time to have arms around her. She was too busy trying to keep the peace in the family. Yep, yep. And so you so, develop the, 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 as I said, it's an addiction, not your fault. There's no, there's no shame or fault, but now we can bring awareness so that you can be responsible. Two very different qualities, right? Responsibility gives you power. Being shameful of an event does not. It's disempowering. You did the best you could as a little girl to keep everyone healthy and happy, and it's translated into a profession, which is beautiful. But I would say that you're operating at such a small percentage of what you're capable of because it's being driven by a deeper fear versus mm -hmm. an authentic mm -hmm. energy. Mm -hmm. what, so, you, know what, you know what? Where I go with this is like, what does it look like to love yourself? What does it look like to put your arms around yourself? Like I hear your words and I, and the, the visual is really good because I am a visual person, but yeah. I, I'm trying to think of where I am not showing up for myself. Yeah. And it's a great question. And much of the conversations that I have with people like this are very hard to answer those questions because I'm literally introducing you to a new world that you're not familiar with. Right. right. So it's imagine there's a wall that you've had in your community that you've known there forever but you don't know what's on the other side of the wall. And one day you open the door and you walk into this completely new paradigm, a completely new construct, but you don't know how to navigate it. Why? Because you just stepped in there. <laughs> yes. Right. So that's what I'm introducing you to. And this is why there's a certain degree of grace and patience. And I'm doing this in a very categoric way with you so that it's step by step. But yeah, you've got great questions and your brain is going to process these things very quickly but what does that look like? Well, you're going to have certain attributes and habits and behaviors that are self-loving. But what I want you to consider what it looks like is the absence of something. And so that mm. seems to be like a Cohen, right? It's like, what does it look like? What will I have now? Or what do I do? Actually, my invitation is self-love for you is going to look like the absence of what you've been doing for so long. Oh, so, so what does that stimulate? Yeah, well, I, you know, I was thinking about this morning, I had a whole bunch of texts, bunch of emails, people requesting things, asking for my help. And I've been like drowning in these requests. And so I sent yeah. some texts back to people who wanted to pop on a phone call with me, wanted to get my help. And I, I reluctantly said, yes. Like I, this one woman, I was like, yeah, let's chat at, at noon on Sunday after I had just told myself I was going to do the whole weekend of doing nothing. And I'm, I'm texting her back thinking, here you go. You're doing it again. You don't want to let her down. You want to help. You can easily give her this answer that she's looking for. And then I've just set myself up for putting myself second again. Yeah. Now you didn't do that. So you can get out of the world of like guilt. You did it like literally, like you type, typed with your fingers or whatever, but the behavior is an extension of your habit, not the real you. There was a little whisper of the real you of like, oh, what are you doing? You've done it again. But that only reinforces usually the shame and the disempowering guilt, right? So what I want you to understand is that is the addiction. You have no choice. You've got, you're drowning in text. You respond, yes, let's chat at noon on Sunday. Like that's all automatic. So right. that's what I'm saying. What does self-love look like? It would be the absence of something, mm -hmm. the absence of that behavior that currently is automated. 
That's what self-love would look like because you're present with you and you make a choice. Right now, you have no choice. You're reacting. To, there's a very powerful, powerful distinction. Texts come into your phone. You're holding your phone and there's messages. And then you respond. That is a reaction. Even the way that you go through the dialogue of, oh, I don't want to do this, but I would and I should and I feel bad. It's all reactive. Mm -hmm. Love is a choice based on what is appropriate for you right now, not because of anything. Right. That is a creative right. choice that comes from true discernment that serves you. So this yes. is where you're going to break free. And you are in this conversation with me, I promise you, because I've already got the words that I want to give you. But right now, it's automated. It's, that's why I said it's an addiction and it's not your fault. This is why we need compassion. We need grace. We need patience, right? So what was, if you were to articulate that little girl's like dialogue in the way that she viewed life in that environment, which has now just been extended into your career. Yes, I understand you get love and worthiness. That's your mother was very loving and all the things that you share. But there's a deeper, more insidious program that runs you right now that I want you to be able to see, because once you see it, you'll be able to break free. So what was, what was the mantra, what was the dialogue or the narrative that that little girl took on in that household in the way that she viewed herself relative to her family? Well, I, I was very cognizant of being the opposite of what my sister was doing. So Great. there that, is that's a, clear. That's clear. don't rock the boat. Do, don't rock the boat or you so won't get part of the dialogue, but it's a little bit darker than that. Well, not darker, but it, the weight of it. So don't rock the boat is it's an avoidant conversation, but you're more proactive, right? Do you understand the in it? So don't rock the boat would be a, you'd be more of a child who was quiet, withdrawn, depressed and parents wouldn't understand. Oh, Mindy's just quiet. We don't understand why that would have been the maladaptive approach to your sister being the bad one. And you're like, okay, well, I'm just not going to rock the boat. I'm just going to kind of disappear into the corner a little bit. Right. Yeah. Can you see that? Yeah. But that's, that's not it. what you did. Right. You, that's uh, well, I, I did that. And then I also did, let me go and, and be the peace, please my mom. Let me go yes, and, and that make to me is the stronger of the two. I'm not saying that yeah. you haven't put your needs secondary, but it's because the language that I hear for you in the program that currently runs your addiction is it was more a proactive, maladaptive response to your environment, meaning you wanted to do something about it. Yes. Yes. Right? So how would you phrase that as it relates to you? Like if you were to say your role in that family and by family, it's extended now to the planet. What is yeah. the way that Mindy declared herself? Uh I will, I will, uh, you know, here's, here's where my brain goes. I see an injustice yeah. and I want to fix it. I want yeah. to, I, 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 I want, want to fix it. Yeah, yeah, that's part of it. So, but there's a deeper level of conditioning that has it be, it's not like I want to fix it. That almost gives you a sense of choice. Like, oh, mm. I want to fix it. But to me, it's a deeper level. And it's supposed to be difficult like this, by the way, because it's a okay. blind spot, right? So you're doing right. great. Thank you. <clears throat> but So that little kid, relative to her sister, was your sister going to take care of things in the house? No. So then what did that say about you? It was my responsibility. Yes. So now you're closed. Now, this is the language I'm not just going to give it to you. It gave me chills so I can feel the resonance. I want you to consider you live in a prison called It's Up To Me. Yeah, I do. I do. So just try that on before you go into any conversation. Just feel the energy, Mindy, because this is dictated. You're 53. My guess is this has been 40 years plus of you. Mm -hmm. It's not even a thought. It's not a choice. It's just the way it is. It's up to you. And if you don't do it, shit's going to hit the fan and everything's gonna go wrong. Now, I want you to presence the pressure of that. If you're gonna get beyond this, you have to see the prison you've been living in. Did you feel that in that, your body? Oh, a thousand, I mean, that the, your words are the core of what, what I think. It, it is, it, if I don't fix it, who, it's, who's gonna fix it? Yes, that's your conscious conversation, but the energy is, 
it's up to me. Now, do you hear the categoric nature of that? It's not like a choice. It's up to me. Like if I don't do it, people die. Yeah, it's up to me for sure. And I, if I go to every single relationship, I go to my marriage, I go to my business relationships, I go to my friendships, I, it's up to me is, is the driving motivator. Like if it's not in harmony, it's up to me to, to make it harmonious. I get it. I get it. But I feel it. And, I, and in order for you to transcend this, I want you to presence and feel the weight, the gravity of that life sentence. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like this is why at 53, I'm finally trying to unwind it. Cause I, it's like yeah. a, a really heavy backpack that I've yeah. just been carrying around with me. And so I, I, yeah, I, I, I would say I don't have to go very far to feel the heaviness of it. It, no, it's in you. You are the heaviness, yeah. right? Uh, yeah, this right. Is, I am the heaviness. Right. Right. So, so if I said to you, you're going to win a white Mercedes next week, what are you going to see on the road all for the seven days? White Mercedes. Yes. Yeah. So going back to what I said, there's not an obstacle we attract. We are the obstacle. It's not that the mm. world needs fixing. That's just what you see. Why? Because right. who you are for yourself is it's up to you to take care of everything and everyone. Through no fault yes. of your own. This is the dialogue. This is the narrative and the language that you learned, you adopted as part of your soul's journey. You curated a family that needed you so that you could fundamentally have a conversation like this and see the, the fundamental lie that it's not up to you. But that's how it occurs to you. Now, this is going to be such a shock to your nervous system, but I'm going to take you through an exercise and this will hopefully see you, show you now that that is... That is a lie. It's not, it's not an actual truth, right? So where were you born? Kansas City, Missouri. Kansas City. Okay, great. So if I were to cut you open, am I going to find a physical manufacturing, pick your material, metal, wood, whatever, but a manufacturing label that says, Mindy, born in Kansas City, it's up to her. Yes or no? Uh, if, say, okay, yes or no. Say it again. Okay, ask yes or no. If I cut you open, am I going to find a physical manufacturing label that on it says, Mindy, born in Kansas, it's all up to her. Um, yes or no? Energetically, yes. And physically, no. Am I allowed right. to answer like that? No, you're not. You're breaking the rules. <laughs> I thought you were a good listener. It's a yes or no response. If I cut you open, am I going to find a physical manufacturing label that says, Mindy, born in Kansas City, it's up to her? No. No. Okay. So it's not part of your hardware, and which you understand, right? If we were to break down and get your DNA and look at your genome, we'd be able to explain the color of your eyes and da da da, right? There's hardware for that. So where does the it's up to me live then if it's not part of your hardware? In my mind. Correct. In your mind. And it's in language, it's words, right? It's mm. up to me. Right. So I want you to consider then if it's just language, it's programming, it's conditioning. Now you've had it for 40 to 50 years. And so it's very, it's got a lot of gravity. It's got a lot. It's very convincing for you. And in fact, I would declare that it's who you think you are. It's not even a choice anymore. It's who you are for yourself. It's up to you. It's just how you respond to life. You, you, you could walk past a cow. This is the joke I use with everybody. And the cow could go moo and Minnie would be like, okay, okay, I'll take care of it. Right. Yeah, it's exactly right. But, you know, and, and here's an interesting, I'm thinking back on a, a conversation I actually had with my, my 22 year old daughter the other day, she was having some dental issues and I wanted, to, it was up to me to fix it. She called me about the health aspect of it. And I said to her, when you go to get the dental work, I'm here for you. I can be there. I can support you. And what she said to me was, I got plenty of people who can support me. I don't need you there. And it killed me. No, it didn't. Listen, it didn't kill you. It was a form of energetic resistance to the way you view yourself. It was actually a gift to make you alive. Hmm. Hmm. Now really get that. That's your daughter. She knows in ways that maybe she doesn't consciously know that her mom is exhausted and trapped. And what I hear in the subtext of that conversation, mom, back off, take care of yourself. I'm fine. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's I what I hear. It. Yeah. But you can't hear that because it's not how you relate to life. You relate to life like it's up to you. 
Like I said, a cow goes moo, it's moo. But the way you hear that is like, okay, don't worry, I'll take care of it. Right, right. This is so then who, it's, you're spot on. And then where my brain goes is, well, then who am I if it's not up okay, to Okay, we're not done yet. Baby steps. <laughs> baby steps <laughs> okay. I have to go slow with you because your brain functions very quickly and you're going to try and figure it out, right? Because it's yep. up to you to figure it all out. You've learned to survive. You're hypervigilant. Yep which makes you a great asset for people, whether it's a daughter with dental work or a patient who needs help or someone who wants you to text you, text them at noon on Sunday, whatever. Like, that's great. I'm not saying that the attributes that you've developed over time are useless. They're not. They're phenomenal. But at what expense? And then it becomes also detrimental to the people you're helping because at one level, albeit not your entire in, intention or your desired outcome, they become dependent on you. So there's a subtle level of disempowering energy with you and other people. Because what you're subtly saying, Mm -hmm. not consciously, is I'll take care of it because you can't. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Interesting. And I know you don't want to be that woman for people. No, I don't. I don't want to be And I'm sure part of, and again, I'm making broad statement. I'm sure much of your dialogue with patients is empowering. I'm sure it's amazing. And they're moved and inspired by the things that you tell them. But energetically, at the deepest level, if Mindy's coming from it's up to me, the, the, the form of the relationship with other people must be you can't do it because it's up to me. Otherwise, I wouldn't attract you in my life. Right. And then I, I probably continue to attract situations like that that make me right. You can let go of the probably. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I go back to, I, I, I see, I mean, thank you, the okay, language okay. we're giving. I'm, I'm tracking, don't worry, I'm listening to every single word. So, yeah. so first of all, you get, the, you get the gravity of the world that you've lived in called, it's up to me. Yeah. And it's not something you consciously think about. Obviously, it was very difficult to get to that. I even had to tell you, because it's so inherent, but it is the core of who you identify yourself to be. Yeah. And it doesn't some it's not something you think about. It just drives your thoughts, feelings and behaviors. No yes. choice. Like ripples right. on a pond. Right. So we yeah. got to the core ripple as far as I'm concerned. Now, because I helped you see it's not part of your hardware. It's not part of your makeup. It's something in your head and it's in language. So this is where it becomes preposterous when you see it your whole life from thoughts, feelings, behaviors and outcomes and the people and circumstances you attract are driven, it's all generated from language, words. It's up to me. Yes. Now you start to see the power of the world that you created with the words that you adopted at a very young age. Yes, yes. Isn't that crazy? It, it's, it's totally crazy. And, you know, I, I see it. Yeah. And it, it's up to, I, I never saw it's up to me. So that's, that is like a huge... Yeah, that's a revelation. You know, yeah. I'm sure the people that know me are like, we've seen it. <laughs> so. yeah, right. They may not have had the words. It's important. Like, it's like if I was coding this piece of software, like people use Zoom or whatever we're using, right? Like, and you go to a coder, they, they have to have the precise code to make sure that the frame is straight or that we can see each other, right? Like, computer programmers. It's not like, ah, don't worry, whether it's a P or an S, it's fine. The computer will figure it out. It, it doesn't work that way. It has no. to be precise. Yeah. And what I'm saying is the same for the intellectual like con- construct of our identity. It's based on specific language. You know that you've overextended yourself. You know that you're tired. You know that you're subservient. You know that you're a people pleaser. Oh, okay, great. But these are all extensions of what you didn't know that you didn't know which is at a very young age, you've adopted code, language called it's up to me. That's, and, and beyond language, it's a feeling. Like it's just an energetic reaction to your environment where you have to step up and take care of everything. Yep. It's not a choice, but now you have the option of choice and freedom because of this conversation. We're not done yet, but because we've gone from, we, we, there's, a, there's an, a sort of a hierarchy. You have to see it's not part of your physical nature. It's, a, it's part of your mind. And what's in your mind, it's thought. We want to make it looser and softer, right? Yes. So that we can quote unquote undo it. So, because if it's like, oh, my eyes are green. Okay. Well, how do I overcome that? Well, that's going to be tough, right? Because that's right. like, really, that's deep code in your DNA, right? Right. But if it's thoughts, if it's just words, it's like, oh, that starts to become quite ephemeral. It's like, 
I, I can't even grab that. Yet it drives all my thoughts, feelings, and behaviors and, and physiological, the things that you deal with. I know you're super smart. You understand the body. So you've probably mitigated a lot of it. But for somebody who can relate to this conversation, who's dealing with cancer or some autoimmune disorder or fibromyalgia, because they're in constant internal tension, like that's like, holy shit. Like that's because they felt the same pressure for 40, 50 years, right? So now I'm going to ask you another question. You can only say yes or no. You know, it's not part of your hardware. You know, it's software based in language. Now, if it's only words that you adopted only because of the environment you grew up in, and you can only say yes or no, does it mean, therefore, that it's categorically true that it's up to you? No. No, it's not. It's just not. That's no. just how life occurs to you. But it's not a truth. Now we start. Now we've got a shot at self-love. Now we have a shot at freedom. Because now you can step back. You can separate from the world of it's up to me by seeing it's not a truth. Yep. Ooh. Yeah. Now, what it's that an means, addiction. I just want to say the addiction word is really, really resonates with me because it feels like an addiction. It's totally appropriate because every human being on the planet, everybody listening to the words that come out of my mouth right now, unbeknownst to themselves, and some may know, are based on an addiction. Every person is an addiction. Mm -hmm. We're addicted to ourselves. We're addicted, addicted to, who to we the idea of ourselves. And beyond that, it's not even an idea of ourselves. It's the resonance that we are for ourselves that got formulated at a young age, not because it's what happened, because that's how we arrived and the events of our childhood turned on that particular conditioning. Yeah. Yeah. And you're here, my dear, in this life to break free of that addiction. And I feel very honored to be able to have this conversation with you so that you can start that journey into true freedom. Because beyond the gift that you are for people now, you get to exponentially enhance that gift for them because they're looking to break free of their own addiction. You help them with mm. the symptoms of their addictions. That's mm. beautiful, better than most people. But if they're still in the addiction, they haven't really gone anywhere. And, and so where my brain goes with that comment is like, oh, so what I just heard is I, if I can break free of this, I can turn around and help everybody else to break free of this. Of course. It's very slippery, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, wait, that's the addiction. What am I doing? <laughs> yeah. So, and here's the irony. You will get to do that, but you'll only do it in a way that is truly authentic and powerful when you are it. Right. Mm, okay. Not because you're doing it, but because you are the essence of freedom, joy, love, vitality for yourself. That becomes the form of resembling something for someone else to emulate and aspire to, not because they're following your instructions on something. Right. So does the does the process now then become observing where I go into it's up to me. Where the addiction just shows up. We're not quite done. So, okay. so I'm going to ask you a question now. So now that you've seen that it's illusory, it's not true, right? Like it's real because it's, it's literally dictated your life for almost 50 years, right? So that's a reality from yes. the way that you think, the way you have to address a text and respond, yes, I'll be there, to the way you talk to your 22-year-old daughter and I can be there. Like that's real. It's happening. And it will have a cascade into your physiology you know, you know how to take care of yourself. So you're probably not sick, but you may have had things that you've dealt with because the energetics have to reflect in the body. But now you can see, oh, that's all based on dialogue. That's not inherently a truth. That's powerful. So now my question is, and this is the new world. I said, there's a wall. You step through the door and you walk into a new dimension. And I said to you earlier, and in response to your question, what does self-love look like? I said, it's the absence of something. And this is the absence of something I'm talking to. The absence of your addiction, the absence to the idea that it's up to you. So my question is, in the absence of knowing now that it's not up to you, in the absence of thinking it is up to you, and this is all going to be generated brand new because I'm stepping into a new world with you, in the absence of realizing that it's up to you, that's gone, what becomes available for Mindy in the way that she would at least feel? The word that comes to me is freedom. Yeah. Hence lightness. Yeah. Yeah. Lightness and en en more energy. I mean, I have a lot, but that could give me a lot more 
Yeah. Energy. It's real energy. It's not survival energy. Because yes. you're now tapped to source. Who you were as an identity was like that cancer cell that has to borrow energy. It's not its own. A real cell that's tapped into the intelligence of the body is connected to source. So you have abundant energy versus energy that is feeling like it has to be there because it's up to me to save everybody. That's, that's right. short lived, which is why you get exhausted. And as I said, where in ways that you may not even know, but your physiology will have had, you know, kept score of that, right? That's right. dis ease. Right. So in the absence of realizing that you have this cancerous idea of yourself, that you're a separate entity and it's up to you to keep the peace and, you know, now extend it into your career, that's gone. Yes, what you're left with is pure freedom. And here's the beautiful part. You can now still choose to take care of people. But before mm -hmm. it wasn't a choice, it was a had to. Yeah. Or, or it was, it was even deeper than that. I, I feel anxiety when I say no, Yeah, I feel like it's course, like, no I can, yeah. So, so let me, let's go back to this text and the, and some of these people that want me to show up a certain way. Yeah. The thought, if I say, okay, that's an addiction. I'm, it's not up to me. I don't need to talk to this woman at noon on Sunday and yeah. help solve her problem. Um, I can be free of that where my brain goes is she's going to be disappointed. And then I have to go back and be like, but it's not her happiness is not up to me. Right. Yeah. She may well be disappointed, but you've also got to recognize that by virtue of the fact that you've had this pattern, this addiction, this narrative for over 50 years, thereabouts, you also have created a literal world around you of people and circumstances that sustain that. So her disappointment is a natural extension of the relationship you've established with her based on your addiction. Yep. Do you see? So what has to happen now in order for you to create a new world for you to live in is you have to create new narratives with the people around you, certainly those that are important to you, to say, hey, I love you. I care about you. But what I've realized is it's been a great expense to myself because I didn't even know, but because of you, and you go into whatever detail you want to with people, but because of childhood circumstances, I felt, I took it upon myself as though it was up to me to take care of everything and everyone. And that has slowly, unbeknownst to myself, been killing me. What I want to provide for you is a much more authentic form of healing, which is to help you see that there's nothing wrong with you. You have some narrative similar to mine that is causing the symptoms that you're asking me to take care of. And I can do that till the cows come home, but until you deal with why you have the symptoms at a deeper energetic emotional level, you're gonna constantly need me. And then when I'm not there, you're gonna feel like you're floundering and you're disappointed. And that's a disservice to you as a human being because you're extraordinary and your birthright is vitality. Mm -hmm. Do you see that's an entirely yeah. different relationship, but it's gonna take you a while to reestablish those connections with mm. people. Because the way that people relate to you right now is, you're the source of their salvation. That's way too much pressure. And it's a disservice and a disempowering way for them to look at themselves as though I need Mindy to take care of me. I'm not saying that you don't have great tools and tricks and practices. I, I talk to somebody to help me with better diet or supplements, but I know right. that it's not because I need them. It's, it's because I want to access, optimize and define deeper vitality. There's nothing wrong with me. Right? right. So that changes. Do you see the energetic exchange now that you have with people is like, you're extraordinary. Be responsible for that shit and I'll help you access it. But your greatest gift to me is when you stop calling me because you figured it out. That's mm. my part. It's like the only reason you need me is to show you that you don't need me. <laughs> That's why I say I don't solve problems. I dissolve them. Why? Because there's nothing wrong with you. But right now you think there is. And if I help you see that's a lie then you get to what I see in you, which is you're fine. You're free. And, and where I go with that, where my, my brain goes is like, but then where's the connection to, I, I'm a, I'm a per, people person. I love to be around people. I'd love to connect to people's hearts. Yeah. So, you know, if I guess where my brain literally goes is if they don't need me, then how will they connect to me? And it will be in a different it's love way. Love as opposed to fear. It's an yeah. entirely enhanced version of a connection. Yeah. You've got your relationships based on dependency, which is an inauthentic way to relate to people. 
Yeah. You there's a whole world of love and harmony waiting to be discovered for you. And I'm not saying you don't get glimpses of it. But right now, the way that you have constructed unconsciously all of your relationships is based on an energetics of dependency. Yeah. So that is it like a new love? Go, say one more. Say that again. It's not empowering and it's not love. So what's waiting for you in the way that you love people? And I love people too. But the way that I relate to people is with more play, with more joy, with more freedom. Mm -hmm. Not with I'm here to save you and fix you. Do you see that's entirely two different worlds? Yeah. Yeah. And is it like an like a a new skill you're learning? It just the, as you step into it, you just got it feels awkward in the beginning and you just start to kind of notice and play with the pieces? Yeah, you're you're as I said, unfamiliar with the world of which I'm introducing you to. So it's yes. going to take practice, but it's sufficiently revelatory, right? It's a big deal for you to go holy shit, I'm 53. For 48, 49 years, I have lived in the prison court. It's up to me. And then you see the cascade of impacts that that's had on your life, right? Now, once you see that, anybody who's tapped into the reason they're here, which is to be free and to honor their true soul, you're just not going to play that game anymore. It's exhausting. Right. It's unfulfilling. Yes. Yes. So once you see that, like, it's like, oh my God, like, what the hell have I been doing? It's like this woman yesterday, 62, three years of chemo like just devastated, no hair, blah, 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 like thinks she's going to die. It's horrific. But when she yeah. saw the whole addiction of her form of prison, oh my God, she was so sad. She see, she's wasted so much time, but now she sees something new available. Yes. I don't have to worry about doing anything wrong was for her. She was so yes. scared of doing something wrong. She's lived in this cage. And I said, just go out there, breathe, enjoy life. If someone's offended, that's on them. It's not that you can't be responsible for your actions. Like if I'm a dick to somebody, it's not wrong, but I can be responsible for like, you know what? I was short. I'm tired. I'm sorry that I said what I said, but it's not right. like I'm a bad person. Do you see the difference? Like I guess yes. responsible yes. for my behaviors, but it doesn't define who I am. So likewise for you, you still get to help people. You still get to care about people, but on your terms, not because it's up to you and you have to. That's an entirely different relationship. And it's going to shift not only your physiology, your energetics, your emotional state. There won't be anxiety. You'll see a phone full of texts. Maybe you'll leave them till tomorrow. Or maybe you'll say, hey, I, I, I love you. I can't deal with this right now. But can you check back with me in a couple of days? Or I don't know. The way that you communicate However, will shift. Yeah. And that will be the practice that then slowly becomes second nature. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. I didn't know I didn't know we were stepping into this today but I the other thing that I love about energetic deep conversations like this is do you know that I just had this conversation in a different format with a friend yesterday and it's 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 interesting cuz my brain is also going like wow you already you, like it's almost like the energy had already been set in motion and then you just stepped in and and took it to a new level so that was amazing, Peter. I, I had no idea we were going down this path, but that was really cool. So I appreciate your insight. I really do. Me, me neither, but it's a pleasure to be able to hold space for you and to have that. And it tends to be a, an occupational hazard of anyone that speaks to Peter Crone. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> to see your lies and where you're stuck. And it's a joy to be able to bring, especially to someone like you, who's you know such a stalwart, such an, an amazing resource for people. The more I can infuse the the inherent freedom that you are into your existence day to day, then the more that's going to get like shared with the people around you, you know? Mm -hmm. And so yeah, yeah. it's just, it's very, it's very fulfilling, you know, to help yeah. people like you who have done such incredible work to help people, but often at your own expense and to now be able to afford the same degree of care and nurturance as a woman, as a doctor, as a caring, loving human, but from a place that is much deeper, much more real, much more profound, and much more healing for you, that that really makes a difference. Yeah. Thank you. So grateful for you. So I, I, I have to remember, we're not in a therapy session. We're actually on a podcast now. <laughs> we <were. laughs> but we were. I don't know where we were. We were somewhere else. Yeah. Um, I, I have one last question for you. And this is something that we've been doing in the new season. Um, we're in season four of this podcast. And every year I, I pick a theme. And this year, the theme is self-love. So Okay, beautiful. Which is That's perfect for this. <laughs> yeah. So my question to you is, 
What what do you feel like your unique gifts are? I know this is kind of silly to ask you at this at this point, but if you could choose three like superpowers, unique gifts that you feel you really bring to this world, what would those be? Freedom, love, and possibility. Mm, yeah. Yeah. And they are the byproducts of I would say the more like dynamic superpowers of listening, seeing, and caring. Yeah. Yeah. I, I said really seeing what's going on and caring to help somebody see the lies of that so they can discover the truth of their own nature, which then brings freedom, love and possibility. Yeah. And, and I, I totally can see that in you. I also will tell you that in your presence, you have a very calming way about you. It just feels like a warm hug, just being at the dinner table with you or being around you. And it, I think that's such a beautiful way to be. And if we could all show up like that, I think it would really be, it, it, it would be profound for ourselves and for everybody around us. So thank you yeah. so much. And the, uh, where can people find you? Because you've got, you're doing some really neat stuff and you've opened up this new freedom community where yeah. people can come in low cost. Talk a little bit about that. Thank you. Firstly, I just want to acknowledge your words because that means a lot to me. And People often do see the same thing in terms of my presence or my energy. Like I could sit next to a stranger on an airplane and we get off and they're like, oh my God, like I've never even told my wife what I just told you. Or like, you know, there's a, and I want people to understand that dynamic so that they can bring it into their own lives, which is it's the absence of judgment, right? Like that I'm holding a space where I know nothing's wrong and there's nothing wrong with you. And so then there's a safety that people can just share things that otherwise they might have felt awkward or embarrassed to share, right? So if there's something that you, whoever's listening, wants to afford a loved one, it would be that energy of just don't make them wrong for anything. Don't judge them mm -hmm. and allow them the, afford them the space of safety that they can share anything with, with you. And especially if you're yeah. a parent, because that to me is what kids need more than anything. Kids are, yeah. kids are reprimanded so readily these days and they're then and into this world of inhibition and fear that, you know, they're, they're not allowed to be them, you know? So anyway, yeah. so thank you for saying that. Um, in terms of, yeah, the freedom yeah. community that's brand new, we uh, were just launching at the beginning of December and uh, I've done a couple of masterminds which are a deeper dive into my work like this and they've mm -hmm. been incredible. And there's a community and as a result, we saw the power of the community where people, we have an app, it's beautiful, people can share, they can, you know, talk about what they've had as, woes or what they've broken through then the community just comes in and swarms with love and support mm, and love that and on a bigger scale so that's what the freedom community is you get daily support and connection with like-minded people you get weekly exclusive content from me in terms of videos and quotes and then there's even a monthly ask me anything and it's just something we want to grow so there's this literally this new world of humans who function from freedom love and possibility well, I will tell you that I will be joining it. And I also w would definitely want to attend or be a part of one of your masterminds uh, in yeah, 23. Right. So let's chat more about that. But Peter, yeah. thank you for your work. I, I really, I just, I, I love humans that are stepping out of the suffering and really showing us a, a new way of being. And that's what I sense. That's, that's what I get from you is like, this is a different way to show up in life that most people aren't seeing. So yeah. thank Very you so much. Yeah. Very astute. It's actually my, if I did have a business vision, it's to give birth to a new type of human being. Yeah. Wow. And Amazing. One well, you're doing it. Of fear and limitation. And, and it's a privilege to be able to help you at least get a glimpse of that. Of course, I just, just to share with you, you know, based on 50 years of conditioning, you know, go easy on yourself. Those habits will come back and, you know, you and I can chat offline sometime and I can support you. But, but you know, it is stepping on beyond the constraints that have bound you, right? And there is a new world there and it's, uh, it's very enticing and something that I want to show the whole world that is available to them. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And I, I, I'm sure that many will be helped by this conversation. So I really appreciate you. No, thank you for your courage to go there too. So again, so in the absence, in the absence of the constraint, thinking that who you are is that it's up to you, who does Mindy become? <laughs>